So to move it on, lads, we'll go on to uh, periodization throughout a season. So again, a much discussed topic. Um, what are your initial approaches, your thoughts on periodization, some things that coaches need to be aware of? Uh, I think, first of all, there's so many... This, I think with football now and periodization, like when you look at periodization, it's true sense, like bumper stuff. It's very much around like peaking for a competition like track and field athletics. Whereas in football, we don't just peak for one event throughout a season or so forth or a number of competitions. We peak like for a number of competitions week to week or multiple competitions within a week, for example. So I think it's important that obviously the, what, what approach you take is, is, is suited to the, the, the environment you work in, the manager you work, work, in, work with and what, how they want to train and, play, and their players to play. Uh, there's so many different like ways of tactical periodization. There's the tr traditional British approach, which was used to like Monday, Tuesday in, Wednesday off, Thursday, Friday game on a Saturday. You've got obviously got the sort of intensive and extensive approach, and then obviously tapering into match day, so forth. So it's only down to the way you feel like you want to train your players and what gets across. Only the players will adapt to that stress. And it, but it sometimes can take time. You obviously see where managers come into these scenarios of different, different playing squads and they've got their way of periodization training. And obviously you sometimes see quite a, an increment in injuries because obviously the players, some of them get through and some of them obviously they, they break along the way. Um, but obviously they want to get to this ceiling of, of, what, of what sort of load that they can tolerate through, through a season. So it, it depends. The journey, the way they get to that can vary extremely. Um, obviously, in, in the rehab stuff that we published, obviously, you think about what, what you're trying to get towards. So, in competition, you're trying to prepare and taper into an event. So, it would be, say, if it's match day Saturday, preparing the players and tapering in for intensity. So, you're going to obviously allow recovery for the early part of the week. You're going to get across your physical component, your technical and tactical component, predominantly physical side in the early part of the week, and then taper in with the technical, tactical component later in the week. Uh, whereas in rehab, the goal is obviously different. You're not uh, peaking for a competition, you're trying to progress the load progressively to the point you want to get to return that player. So, my one of this stance is obviously communication when the management staff come in, first understand their training methodology and the way they want to train, what's their match day build up pattern look like, and try and understand that first of all, and obviously try and over time understand that, and then obviously try to guide them into a way that might be more beneficial and obviously the way you train within those certain days and the physical qualities that will help the, the manager to be more successful. And obviously, success is judged on obviously winning games, making sure players are avail available and so forth. Anything else, Tom? Yeah, it's, it's all designed around the management. Um, so we as a support staff have to advise them as best as we can with uh, the knowledge we have and an experience on the players that uh, they're working with. Um, first and foremost, there isn't a right or wrong way. Um, I've worked with managers who have been successful doing a range of different models. Um, I've worked with managers who have done six to seven day run-ins. So I've worked with managers who have uh, the match day minus two off, the, the manager that had a match day minus three off. It, it ranges different uh, uh, to different managers and you just have to find the best way of applying their model um, within the group of players that you have. Um, I tend to, to find that a, a team will mess up on the two days after a game or the two days before a game. Uh, that tends to be your key moments um, of where you can probably do a bit too much or uh, too little um, for individuals. Um, however, I seen things where players have done really big sessions the two days in the lead up to a game and they've been fine and when you go you're just a little bit tired tiredness doesn't always won't uh, necessarily stop you winning a game um it's whether they can work within that fatigue state at, at certain points um there are a few things that i'd probably look at um within the periodization model so you, you'd have to try and check a few things off um so first and foremost, do we expose the players to the required stimulus? So for their required position, so is it a, a winger or a centre-back? We have to expose them to what they're going to be required to do. And it might be, for example, the max speed we talked about. Um, 
they may not do that uh, for eight or ten games, but when they they do do it, we need to know that they've been exposed to that within a, within the environment of training. Um, train them under fatigue. Uh, make sure that uh, we know that they're they're capable of thinking within the manager's game model when tired. Um, as well as fresh, and you have to do that around certain time points of the season. Um, build that tolerance of stress. So, for example, when um, you're going to come to a Christmas period, there's a chance that you play a game on the 26th, um, you then have a rest day on the 27th, and then on the 28th you play a game. So if you have not got players ready to do that, um, you will struggle in that period. And we, we'll probably start planning for, for the Christmas period around... Uh, October, November time, um, early November, just to make sure that that exposure to that stress has been built up. Um, work players both in the large and small areas. Um, so don't just do uh, extensive sessions every day because you're going to increase your risk to, to injury. Um, shape it up uh, in different ways and like the tactical periodization model does that quite well. Um, then once you've exposed them to these different stimuluses, make sure that we understand that recovery is important. Um, I think sometimes it gets neglected a little bit, especially in the heavy congested period uh, of, of a season. Um, but that's where you'll get your key gains, um, being able to expose the players at a higher intensity as well uh, by allowing that recovery. Um, so for me, is uh, intensity trumps volume. Um, Teams that fans have said uh, are unfit, it was um, a, a common factor was that uh, the training volume was fine, but the intensity was fairly low. Um, when fans have said that, oh, they're one of the fittest teams we've ever seen, it's because the intensity of training is really high. Um, so that would be a, a big part that I would focus on. Um, and then, most importantly, know the individuals you're working with. So whether you're working with um, a player who has a big injury history is going to be different to a, a young kid who's come up um, through the ranks and whether your squad is a younger squad or an older squad um, and understand, like we said earlier, how do they respond to certain lows and, and then if they respond differently, have we um, kept the information of when they've responded differently previously and what was the outcome from that? So, for instance, Ben, if you were a player and um, we've done certain things and you've said, oh, I'm, I'm really sore today, I feel it on uh, one of my right hamstring, is that a common thing that you say? Uh, if it's not, then it might be an alarm bell. Uh, and then we delve further into it. If it's something you say regularly, um, we'll take, take into consideration, but we know that's just how your body responds. Um, and it's just knowing what's important and what's not important. Um, and using the information we've collected previously uh, to determine how we're going to proceed. This might be slightly off topic, but at the same time, I think it, it sort of links in quite well. And it, I think it'll be a good one for yourself, Matt. We, I put um, the uh, opportunity for some of our community members to ask questions. And one of the questions that we got, I've already asked a few of them throughout the episode, but um, one of the questions was, uh, this coach is working with um, academy players and it was how to prepare the scholars or the academy players for the jump up in volume. So going from like two to three sessions a week to suddenly like a full-time program. And I think that, that sort of ties in quite nicely there. So what would be some key things for you, Matt? So you mean the transition, say, from being a, say, an under-16 to an under-18 rather than an under-18 to a first-team environment? Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Uh, I think the it's it's actually when you think about it on the on the surface, it would seem like, like a really that's a big challenge, and and there's there's so many factors that can influence that because you think sixteen is sort of the back end of what you think peak height velocity would be in a in a male adolescent player. They should pretty much have gone through that then. So in terms of risk of obviously you sometimes see some overuse injuries that happen within peak height velocity because load is not dropped and obviously growth and maturation can cause potential risk factors just uh, pars defects etc shin splints so forth 
So it's important to, to, to obviously like profile those players that are coming through that. Have they gone through that? Obviously, is their growth and maturation being monitored and, and through that process? So when they do go from a 16 to an 18, do we know that they've been through that? Or can we sort of, sort of objectively say they may have been through that? Because we don't know without obviously taking bone data, for example. So I think the easiest way to do that is, I think, when I when obviously left my other club, we were starting to look at like um, GPS data through academy settings and what they're doing from, say, 14s, uh, 15s, 16s, 18s, 23s, first teams. So we're, we're aware of the load demands that across the academy groups. So you can sort of see, and then obviously taking basic information such as duration, number of sessions, obviously gives you an indication of where the gaps and where they need to prepare for. So it's slowly, can you and use that information, like Tom says, like we would do in a first team setting, to prepare these players for the potential demands they're going to face. And obviously, you know, you've got then the challenge as well. Typically, at the, the elite level, teams would use absolute speed zones. Then with a developing player, you've got the, do we need to look at relative speed zones and setting that to the, the individual? Because there can be huge differences. So you could, they could be hitting sprint speed, but they're not hitting sprint speed, if that makes sense. So it's understanding these sort of differences that exist between the elite male player, because when we talk about elite players, we're talking about first team pros, and then we're talking about developing players, who are obviously 16s, 18s, 23s, they're not elite players yet, they're becoming elite players. I think we've got the tendency to, to label them as elite academy players, but really they're just developing academy players, they're not elite football players yet. So I think it's to understand the context, and obviously prepare them for the demands of coming up through that, so how does the 18s train? How does the 18s coach want that to his players to play? And then communicating down to that to the relevant member of staff who deals with the 16s group. It's, it's, collected, it's an information finding, collecting information session where, and then preparing the players for those demands. Cavs, would you say that that jump there is a bigger jump than going from 23s to first team? Yeah. yeah. The only difference I would say my experience looking at information over a number of years between the 23 sometimes you get a 23s group that trains a lot harder than the first team group but then you do see when you look at the internal response to like less running load like the internal response is much much higher so you might get a much greater like weekly accumulation like heart rate exertion time of 85 percent max heart rate in a 23s player doing less running load with the first team which comes down to that it's not just about running load, it's around, yeah, you might be, I say, an under 18s player, a 23 player, he's capable of doing 350 metres of sprint distance in, in, in matches, then he gets, that's more than what a first team player does, yeah. then he gets to the first team and it's almost like rabbit in the headlights because it, the speed and the intensity of the technical demand is so much higher. And it's obviously then that period of adaptation that's required for that player to adapt to that and see how they adapt to it. Because some players find it too, too challenging. So I would yeah. say that the jump up, typically from what I've seen from 16s to 18s, is harder than a 23 going to a first team environment. Yeah. Yeah, and it's also it's a fine balance act at that, that under 16s to under 18s level because if you get past right, you're out for a while. Um, yeah, and, and yeah, if you, if you get a serious injury like that, which obviously the the return to play process is is quite challenging because it's a lot around communication, and obviously you can do scans and you can do scans at a periodized point to see how the the fracture's healing. But obviously, it's, sometimes you, the fracture can show healing, but the player can still get sensations yeah. when they come back in. So it's obviously managing that player and managing that period of joining team training, knowing that they may, may still get some sim symptoms, which if, you, if you've had that type of injury and you're still feeling symptoms, like for me, if I had that situation, I would feel a bit concerned as a player. So it's obviously managing that time frame in between rehab and returning very, very careful, carefully. And obviously, like the, the demands of growing as well, you've got to think about the, the energy differences as well. Because you've got eating practices in 16 year olds can be very challenging making the jump for energy demands. I think uh, Marcus Hannon did great, some great work on this in his PhD at Everton, looking at the energy demands uh, between the academy groups. Uh, and obviously, it's important to make sure that the groups get an adequate energy, energy intake, not just to fuel the training demands, but obviously growth and development as well. Yeah. yeah, class. And sort of back on to where we we're at in terms of in the season. Another thing I thought we could bring up, and I know we've touched on some of these already, were some other, I've, I've wrote down flexible factors. So some things that you have to 
take into account throughout the season. You mentioned about max speed, that you have to be flexible with your approach about um, max speed exposure. But what are some of the things as you're going through the season that sort of jump out for you that you, you have to be really flexible and adaptable with? Strength training. For sure, like strength training in, in the first elite first team environment can be very challenging. You can get the scenarios where you have players that have come up through the academy and are used to doing that on a, on a, on a, back, on a, on a weekly basis and, and can lift quite competently. Um, then you get obviously players who have come from Brazil, who have come from Spain, who obviously the methodology of doing things is very different or they may not have done any strength training at all. So obviously it's being aware of that and it's obviously knowing that obviously the training age, knowing what exercise is appropriate. It's knowing the, the adaptations you're looking to, ab to obtain and the responses you get from certain contraction modes and then the volume that you do in proximity to when obviously competition is. But it's also knowing that it's beneficial. Obviously we talk about this term robustness, which you can increase in the capacity and resilience to handle load. We know that certain types of strength training are important, obviously. But to, to train these qualities. So, but we know as a consequence of doing strength training and doing certain types, eccentric specifically can cause obviously delayed onset of muscle soreness, localized heavy leg feeling. But it's knowing that when we've done them over say two or three weeks, we get this repeated bout effect, which knowing that we don't get the, the same level of soreness and fatigue from doing that type of exercise again. Mm -hmm. But it's keeping consistency through the season and knowing the, the effects that each type of contraction mode will have. And when we screen our players, obviously knowing that previous injury risks they have, knowing what, what they, the background they've come from an athlete, whether it be from Brazil, they're not used to doing loads of strength training. So it might be some low level isometric work for that player around, say the, the hip adductors, for example, because obviously we might see that they've got a, um, a deficit left to right and an ab abduction weakness, which we might be able to work on, which is ultimately going to keep that player available. So it's taking all these different factors in account around strength training, strength training in football, where the, where the match day is, uh, what, back, what, how much strength training they've done through the season, keeping a log of what players have done, and obviously being really adaptable to that. The player might come in after training and say, I can't do that, I can't do three sets at 85% at 1RM example, I can't do that today. So obviously it's being flexible with that and obviously being adaptable for that. And I think being experienced in this environment, working with many different athletes of many different ages, teaches you being how to adapt to and how to obviously get, get what you need from the player with that, with that level of communication that you need. Yeah, that comes down to knowing the individual as well, isn't it? You know, and, you know, like said, before, nothing in which ones are Communication is crucial, where it's on-pitch activity or off-pitch activity, where it's uh, nutritional uh, interventions that you have in place for certain players. It's all these things, communication is crucial to get buy-in from players. And, and being really concise and having rationale for why you're doing something that you can communicate with the players that if they ask, but in a concise manner that is maybe different to the way that us three may communicate. Mm. Yeah, and that, that for me was a key learning point early in my career is that the explanation of things is important to a player. Yeah. So I remember having a player up going, why are we doing this? And uh, you explain the reason and go, well, why didn't you tell me that before? <laughs> so I might do, do a... a Something for the players, it'll be right. The reason why we're doing this is because of this. It'll be quick, concise, and then as soon as you've said it three or four times, they understand right. We need to do this because of this. Mm -hmm. um, to be fair, Arsenal to give kudos to Shad and um, Barry. Uh, I've never seen the uptake of Jim from the amount of players uh, in a football club um, as good as this. Um, it's very much well driven into them. Um, so when I arrived, they were used to doing match day plus two tests, and they go through a range of different tests and. That was run by Colin and, and Ben uh, Ashworth, who, when I first got there, um, and that's continued with, with Jordan Reese taking on the mantle of that. Um, and uh, yeah, with Shad and Barry there, had the, the boys doing the um, doing their gym stuff after a game. So after a game, they'd have minimal exposure of, of different uh, exercises uh, that players needed to do. And um, yeah, uh, the boys uh, respond really well to it. Um, I know it was a big thing of, uh, of when Berjo was here as well. We wanted to try and push players where we could, um, make sure we get the exposure in them uh, as often as we could and without affecting the next game um, and, and finding where we can get those, those moments in. I think like, like people talk about it all the time, the role of like strength coaching football. And I think 
it's an important role, but it has a small yeah. part to play in the bigger picture of, of a football environment. And I think it's knowing the role it plays and how it can be beneficial to, to a manager and a team um, for the fit and healthy players. And obviously, it's very important for the player returning from, from injury as well. Yeah, and that's, I don't think um, enough s and sports scientists understand that you're a big part of creating a culture. Um, so we, uh, as um, being very close to players, we can push players a certain direction. So you don't want to... Uh, you want to create an environment where, look, we, we're here to work, we're here to, to develop you, improve you, and um, we are just, those people who are around the players don't realise how important they are in making the culture what the club wants it to be. Um, and it just takes a few comments to ruin that culture. Um, and that's where it comes back to that communication, keep everyone together on the same action plan. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's how you can, you can really get a club to... to to lift off um, if everyone's on that same that same plan and uh, I guess in, in moments like this of being adaptable it's key that the staff are able to adapt you have to have staff that if something changes last minute and in football pretty much every day something changes last minute you have to be able to think on your feet and go right okay what do we do now it's no good sitting there moaning oh I had this planned it doesn't work like that to you so for instance Tabs, I'm, I'd imagine you've had a uh, a rehab session plan and suddenly an extra player is thrown in. Yes. You have to adjust, right, okay, now these are the drills that I need to do. Um, the most flexible thing in, in, in a season, it has to be the staff. You have to be flexible in what you've got to do. Um, I mean, you keep your key principles, but you you adapt around what's what's happening around you. Um, I think that's a, a real key learning as uh, part of my journey through my career is that uh, if you don't adapt, you, you, you'll sink. Because that's what I was going to say to you, Matt, as well, when we're talking about flexibility with strength training, is that you have flexibility, but you also have, like, have to have like a systemized approach for that as well, don't you? So if you can't do this, you do this. Of course. Um, but that, that, becomes, that comes from sort of experience, doesn't it? Like you're not going to have those systems built in. You're going to, it's a bit of panic initially, isn't it? Like, oh, I don't have enough time or I don't have, I, I can't do these things. Some of the scientific base behind like, like the, the strength conditioning training. Like, for example, if you want to prime someone before they go out for training, like, traditionally, the priming research would say, like, heavy strength training, like, two or three reps, low volume, long rest in between to prime the nervous system. But it's all, when you look in the research, you can actually, like, innovate more motor units isometrically than you can concentrically or eccentrically. Hmm. I think this is where the prevalence now of isometric training is coming, and obviously overcoming isometrics are very good for, like, like a neurological and for ramping the nervous system which obviously as well, they don't have the, the damaging effects of uh, eccentric exercise. So I think it's understanding the physiology behind the different types of strength training you're using and the adaptations you're going to get. And I think well, if, you, if, if anyone's aware of some of Phil Glasgow's work on optimal loading in the terms of um, rehabilitation, that transfers obviously across to the fit and healthy athlete. If I'm looking for tendon adaptation, tendon stiffness, obviously it's going to be the same. I'm going to look to train that in a healthy player. There's no different. So it's, it's just understanding the principles of, of basic solid science and then a, a practically applying them so people can understand them. And I think hopefully that's what we've, we've tried to do in some of the case uh, reports that we've published is the, the, the approach, the optimal loading approach to different type of injuries, how it's not an all, a one size fits all. So you might get a player who's come from the academy, he's got an injury, who can hip hinge perfectly or whatever. Then you might get a player who's got a really poor training age or you're adding support to get them in these positions. So it's understanding that you can't just go, oh, well, I want this player to RDL, I want this player to RDL. Well, you might not be able to. Mm. So you might have to switch it up and go for a pull through or something like that. There's a different variation. That it's going to take less load for get him to get an adaptation because he's not used to doing, the, he's not used to that stimulus, where the trained player is going to need more load to get the additional stimulus. So it's understanding all these different complexities that exist. So I think underlying physiology, I think, there was this big debate around experience and knowledge and so forth. Don't get me wrong, like the experience you need, but knowledge is crucial to apply that experience. They really, they do knit together really, really crucially. Definitely. Now I know we're getting on with time here, so I'm going to try and get through this last bit and then let you lads go. But Tom, this is def I think this is one for you, but in terms of data, and it's something we've spoken about quite a lot before, on the podcast, how do we use data, the data, all the data sets that are available 
um, to have the greatest impact. So how do we prioritize? Um, and I know you probably have touched it on it a little bit already, but what's your sort of views on that? Um, so you, it doesn't matter whether you're collecting all the information in the world or you're just collecting RPEs or time training. As long as it's informing your decision, then it's affecting your practice. Um, but I could have the best data set in the world, but if it's not affecting what, uh, what we're doing, it's pretty useless. Um, so yeah, first and foremost, find out how the coaches um, disseminate information. So is it a, a visual, do they like this team data? Is it a bar graph? Uh, and find a way that uh, speaks to them. So, um, for example, uh, a board tab to death for this, but stress scores, is that something that came from... Uh, Interest already listening to it. <laughs> so Steve Tash had come up with the original idea uh, when he was at Everton, uh, and he presented something at a conference saying about, okay, we, we have these values that are given to players and we track them um, through a period of time. And I know... Darren Burgess, is, he does exactly the same as calls a Burgess score where he gives a player a score and tracks them over time. Now, I thought there's a way of putting information together um, that could then produce those numbers for us and say, right, this is how difficult uh, or stressful a session was for a player. Now, when I used to re uh, give that to a manager, um, I gave him a sheet and it was just a load of numbers um, and I was like going, right, you've asked how, how um, what the current status is for each player, or this is their current status. And he goes, Tom, what am I going to do with this? It's just a number. It doesn't help me at all. So then I realised that you have, to, you have to tell a story. So I've done this in a few presentations where you have to show them the story. So we now have graphs of every individual. Um, uh, so it might be, you can see where their peaks are when they're playing games. You can see that uh, when they're tailing off, if they've been injured, uh, you can see when they've been exposed to certain loads, and then you also see the response to wellness. So you, you have to have a visual that people are easy to understand, or you can explain it in a really concise man manner. Because if you have uh, to explain it to a coach or a manager, you may only have five minutes. Um, so it has to be quick and, and easy to, to understand. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, just to find out what your key um key information is so the key information we have at arsenal will be different to the key information we had at, at villa and then i'm sure it's different at everton but it's finding out the culture at your club and what's important to you and your your game model for that manager uh and building it around that um and it's just any information you give out to people keep it as simple as possible now we can go underneath the hood and have so much more information going to it. And if someone's really interested, we can show them. So I'm sure Mikhail, uh, so Mikhail Shulkin, who's our, our data scientist, he is an absolute whiz kid with, with numbers. Um, however, the level that he goes to, I'm never going to give to to a manager or a coach because that's just going to go way over their head. So make sure that we are the filters um, that provide that information. So it has to be... Uh, so simple to understand, but also apply the context to that information. Um, so when they have that understanding, that's when it resonates with a manager or a coach. Um, and then you can make your decisions based off that. Now it's important to understand that data itself is not the be all and end all. Um, it's, I've seen uh, practitioners chase numbers. I've seen practitioners absolutely lose their head when they're playing in 20 metres of sprint on match day minus one. Uh, it is not the end of the world. Um, these players are, are physical monsters. They can, they can cope with a lot of stuff. Um, but it always comes down to the person um, given that information. Um, throughout my time, I've worked with so many different practitioners, so many different people. It's the people skills that... Um, show the difference between a, a top practitioner and someone who can't get their information across. Um, you can have all the knowledge in the world, but if you can't affect uh, how a person reacts, then it's going to be useless. Um, so it always comes back, the people that make those decisions and the people will interpret that information for, for those to, to make a decision. I think to sum it up, it's basically data-informed practice, not data-driven practice. Yeah, it's wrong. Coming up.
And I think, yeah, I think the time's gone where you get a match report and it's 13 pages long and your, ma your manager sees that and goes, well, what's this? It's just a pile of numbers. Only the manager needs to know, okay, what does it mean? And how does it affect going into the next game and then into the next weeks? It's the context of what it means for him and how he prepares his players. Not what the match out for. Oh, we did 100 metres sprint more than... Yeah, that's fine. But what does that mean? You need to, It's the meaning. And what does that mean going forward now into the plan? Yeah, and then I've also seen um, some people will give the same report to different managers. Yeah, different people interpret different information. So you need to then speak to... The manager, so if you have a new manager that comes in midway through a season, okay, boss, what do, how do you work? What kind of information do you need? So I've worked with managers who don't want to report, they just want to chat to you. Okay, what do I need to know? I've had managers um, who want to see raw numbers uh, and I've had managers who want uh, to see a bar chart and, and just sit with them, explain it and, and what we need to do. Um, so you need to adapt and find out what's key for that, that person who's uh, who's steadying the ship because then they, we're all trying to um, find the best ways of, of winning a football match. No, I'd echo, I'd echo the what, what you said, Tom. Well, lads, this was absolutely class. I think there's loads in this and uh, I know we're getting towards Tab's having to do his first night feed so we better, uh, <laughs> we, we better wrap it up there. I think we've covered everything that we set out to do um, plus more so Really appreciate you both coming on. Do you want to just give us a quick heads up on where people can either drop your line or just keep a, an eye out for what you guys are up to? Yeah, um, you can message me on LinkedIn or through Twitter. Uh, Twitter's talent underscore five. Um, I am really bad at getting back to people because I have so many people who ask questions. I do get back to you. It might be six months down the line, but I will get back to you. Uh, he doesn't answer the phone when I ring him so no yeah <laughs> <laughs> but we're very open so it's if someone has an idea or um, can see an issue with what we've discussed about um, please uh, please come and contact us with um, like a big thing that both myself and Tabs are, we'd like to hear from from other people so I know at Arsenal we try and get um get other companies in so for instance uh, we've had Apple come and tell us right this is how we would interpret the information that you have this is an easier way of doing this this is the technology we would use um, we've had NASA speak to us about um, nutrition anyone if you think you have something please tell us and we'll look at it and and we'll discuss it yeah no likewise LinkedIn or at Matt Taberner um, those as well like any research if anyone's interested in in research like as well um, around any of the stuff that we've talked about and fancies uh, getting involved to have a discussion or a chat like we're both open-minded both like to have discussions around how we can improve practice and help educate other practitioners as well because it's obviously us giving back something we've been privileged to have this experience in this environment so if we can help other young aspiring sports scientists to come through and be better at their jobs then hopefully that's what we can we can try and do Class. Well, lads, listen, thanks a lot for coming on and giving up your Saturday night. Really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully we'll get you on again before episode 200. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, lads. No worries. <laughs>